everyone, everyone has a faith story. And everyone's faith story is unique. Even if you are here with us in the room or online and you're not even sure you believe there is a God yet or who Jesus is, you're just kind of seeking that out, you have a faith story. And frankly, we are so thrilled that you are here with us to share in that faith journey. Everybody has a faith story and it's unique to everyone. To understand your unique faith story, and more importantly, to understand how God has affected that journey, how God has influenced that journey, is really important. Because God is relentless and persistent in his pursuit of us, in his love for us. It is like... The love of a good mother who never gives up, who's always there, who's always present. So let me say, happy Mother's Day. Your love for your children is a reflection of God's love for us. We are beginning today a series, three-part series, on the Holy Spirit. It's not something you often hear preached about in the Lutheran Church, frankly. We're going to begin today and then... Uh, conclude on Pentecost when we're all wear red two Sundays from now. And what we're going to see in this series is how persistent and relentless is God's love for us through the work of God the Holy Spirit who loves us like a good mother. So as we lean into this series now, here's the question I want you to focus, begin to focus on right now for this service and in the weeks to come. What has led you to where you are now in your journey of faith? What has led you to where you are now in your journey of faith? Or in other words, how did you come to believe? In my faith story, there were years of a secret confusion and then a great revelation. I grew up in a Lutheran church my whole life. I don't ever remember a time when I was not in church. And so I heard many, many times that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You heard that before? Like forever in the Lutheran church. And I got it. I knew that salvation, my salvation, my forgiveness, my new life was not my work. I didn't earn it. I didn't do good to get it. It's a free gift unilaterally given to me by God. I got that. That's what grace is. But then I was confused. Because we said we're saved by grace alone through Faith alone. I said, that that doesn't go together. That seems to contradict one another because I saw faith as my work, as my step, as my decision. When I accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, that's my move. In, In the church I grew up with, in there was a lot of influence of Billy Graham in our church, which, you know, the great evangelist. Do you remember what Billy Graham's title of his radio show and his TV program was starting back in the 50s? It was The Hour of Decision. The Hour of Decision. And at the end of every program, you were encouraged to decide for Christ, to accept Christ. So that's what's rumbling around in me. And I'm thinking, I don't get this, that it's all God, but what about faith? That's my work. And I was confused that I didn't tell anybody because I thought I, you know, I was embarrassed about it. It was a secret confusion. I thought, boy, I really must have missed something in catechism, which if you knew me in junior high would be totally understandable because my parents had to force me to go. It was a, a weekly wrestling match. I resisted it a lot. Well, in catechism we got to memorize this beauty. 
Martin Luther's small catechism. Who had to memorize Martin Luther's small catechism? Let me tell a little sidebar about memorization. Memorization, sadly, we've moved away from it. But memorization for someone who's in middle school is an age-appropriate and effective learning technique. Because let's face it, how are you going to teach a person who's on the early side of symbolic thinking when they're still in concrete thinking? How are you going to teach them about the Trinity? Or the dual nature of Christ? Or the tension of grace and works. How are you going to teach it? You can't, but when you memorize, it gets in your mind and in your heart and starts to ruminate and ripen and get you ready for the day when you can learn and acknowledge and accept those great truths. And that's exactly what happened to me. Because one of the things we got to memorize in this beauty is Martin Luther's explanation of the three articles of the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, which we're going to, I guess we may not be saying it this service, this day, but it's divided into three articles. First article about our belief in God the Father, second article about our belief in God the Son, and the third article about our belief in God the Holy Spirit. And Martin Luther's explanation for each of those articles. And here is his explanation of the third article about the Holy Spirit. I believe that I cannot by my own understanding or effort believe in Jesus Christ or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me through the, go- the gospel, enlightened me with his gift, and sanctified and kept me in true faith. This was the answer to my secret confusion. That faith is given to us as a gift, all by grace, through the work of God the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't see that at the time. I didn't understand at the time. But it was in there ruminating around in me, ripening. And then years later, when I had to memorize this again, when I was in seminary, Pastor Mike and I went to the same seminary. We we had to show up at a certain time and a person would say, okay, give me Martin Luther's explanation of the third article and had to give it. That's when I was ready. And it it was a revelation that came to me that, that faith is all God's work. That became, for me, one of the most significant steps or understandings or revelations in my journey of faith. And it led me to understand God more and to be more thankful and more deeply in love with God. I want us now to turn to the scripture and see how this teaching is taught in the Bible. The first lesson is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, and verses 26 And 27. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Moving to verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The second lesson is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such oppression from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of our Lord. 
The gospel lesson is from St. John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 18, and verses 26 and 27. John, chapter 14, beginning at verse 15. Jesus taught, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Moving to verse 26. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. I invite us to all say these words together, if you're ready to do this. That is Martin Luther's explanation, the beginning of Martin Luther's explanation of the third article three. Let's say it together. I believe that I cannot, by my own understanding or effort, Believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in true faith. So who is God, the Holy Spirit? What's what I taught the children today? This is what the book of Genesis that we read reports. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God, the Spirit, they're there. And if you read John chapter 1, so is Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. Fully there, fully God. Three persons in one God. Now, as I told the children, in Hebrew, which has masculine and feminine nouns, not like English, more like Spanish, The word spirit, ruha in Hebrew, which means breath and spirit and wind, is a feminine noun. Because of that, and some of the other passages I mentioned to the children, I know people who, when they talk about the Holy Spirit, use the feminine pronouns. So we'd say, you know, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel and lightened me with her gifts, and sanctified and kept me in true faith. Now, maybe for you that's like, oh, that's going too far. I'm frankly comfortable with that. Because also here is this interesting verb. Now, this is, you know, first two verses in the Bible. Hovering over. This is a very ancient word. In fact, it predates the Hebrew language. And because of that, Biblical scholars and translators struggle. How do you translate this word? Because there's, there's no context. Because it, it was a word before there was even a language called the Hebrew language. It means hovering over. So you get this picture of God hovering over, the Holy Spirit hovering over creation, back and forth. It, it actually is kind of, could be translated like, like this, just kind of going everywhere, over. One of the translators uses the word brooding, like a mother had brooding over creation. So putting that together, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit's kind of like a helicopter mom. <laughs> now that's, that's a, usually used as a negative term, right? They're like, oh, it's a helicopter mom. But let's think about this. That's what a mother and, frankly, a father should be hovering over their children, especially when they're young. I mean, you don't, they're not born, you're like, well, take off, you know, good luck. You hover, you brood over your children. That's what a good mother is, and that's the picture of God, the Holy Spirit, at the beginning of brooding over our lives, that God is hovering over our lives, that there is this relentless and persistent presence in our lives in the person of God, the Holy Spirit. This is reinforced in verses 26 and 27. 
God said, let us, plural, who's us? Well, that's God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right there in the first chapter of the Bible is the Holy Trinity. Let us make humankind in, there it is again, plural, our image. You know, anytime you've read that carefully, you're like, who's us here? Who's us? Well, this is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. According to our likeness, in the image of God, us, he created them, male and female. So, frankly, I'm quite comfortable Understanding God, the Holy Spirit, as a mother in a, in a feminine, you know, in a feminine term. So, God, the Holy Spirit, is in, is so in love with us that she hovers over our lives to do what? Now, this is the question: to do what? This is what the next three weeks are going to be about. Each week we're going to look at one aspect, one action that the Holy Spirit accomplishes in our lives affecting our, our faith story. Jesus begins to answer this question in the gospel lesson. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. Now I want you to look at the word another here. In the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as our advocate the one who advocates before, before the Father for us. But here he uses another. Okay, Jesus, who's the another? Well, that's the Holy Spirit he's talking about. To help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, to know him, for he lives with you. He hovers over your lives, in your lives, but then even deeper, and will be in you. When we come to faith, we understand that God is in us. The place that God intended to dwell with us. Because when he created us, he breathed into us his breath, his ruha, his spirit to live inside of us in our hearts. And in the work of Jesus Christ, that original blessing is restored. And God lives in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. I will... I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So when we think about Jesus coming to us, if you were in Sunday school, you learn where's Jesus? Jesus is in my heart. You probably learned that or sang a song about it. It's talking about God the Holy Spirit because Jesus and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are one God along with the Father. And so, but when we think precisely, theologically, biblically of who that is inside of our hearts. Yes, it's Jesus, but more precisely, it is the Holy Spirit. Jesus then teaches what the Holy Spirit does. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. Jesus is teaching here that the work of the Holy Spirit is to lead us into faith, to guide us into faith through teaching us about Jesus. In John 16, verse 13, Jesus goes as far as to say this, the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. In other words, guides us to faith. Our faith is wholly the work of God, the Holy Spirit. It is not our work. Look how the writer of Hebrews understands this and teaches this that we read today. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Now, next week, Pastor Michael will talk about the perfecter part. But here, pioneer. This is really a fun word in the Greek in the New Testament. And translators have had, you know, a jolly time translating this in a lot of different ways. Pioneer, founder, author, inspirer, initiator, originator, source. To say it simply is this. The Holy Spirit creates our faith in Jesus. And this is taught over and over again in the New Testament. A little later on today, I'm going to post on our Facebook page, St. Luke Facebook page and on my own, a link to an article by John, John Piper that goes through 
other verses that I don't have time to go through today that teaches this truth. That it is the work of God, the Holy Spirit, to create in us faith to trust in Jesus. Paul, in Romans 2, 12, verse 3, goes as far as to say this. God gives each person a unique measure of faith. That's the unique part of our, our faith stories. We each have a unique measure of faith. To some one, he gives this amount of faith. To another, he gives this amount of faith. Because it is God's work, holy, to give us faith, to create us faith. This, dear ones, was the great revelation for me. The great breakthrough one of the great breakthroughs in my journey of faith. That I cannot by my own understanding or strength believe in Jesus Christ or come to him. But the Holy Spirit is the pioneer who blazed the trail into my mind and in my heart and built a homestead of trust in me to have faith in Jesus. This put so much together for me. In fact, I, this was one of the key points in my senior uh, certification paper. Remember having to write that? Like, you know, that was a tense time, and it's one of the key things I put in. And for those of you that are here today in the room or online who are still kind of in that journey of seeking faith or wondering about faith or questioning, God is all over you. He is hovering over you. You may not see that, but he is, isn't he, Matthew? Matthew once asked me as he's in his dirty face, like, is God in my life? And I'm like, you can't, he's all over you, leading you to faith. Because that's what God does, hovers over us. Now, you may say, okay, <laughs> what is our role then in having and growing in faith? This is our role. Stay engaged. Stay engaged. To put ourselves, continue to put ourselves in places where God's word is taught here in worship, in your daily quiet times, in your life groups, and wherever, maybe the podcast you listen to, where God's word comes into you and is around you, stay engaged. It's kind of passive, but really our role is to just put ourselves in a place where God, the Holy Spirit, will do the work. And as well as we stay engaged, we also do this. We remain curious. We remain curious. Like when we are in the place where God's word is being taught, like right now, we remain curious about it, interested, open to what it's saying to us. That's our role, to stay engaged and to stay curious. We put ourselves in places where God the Holy Spirit will do the work of leading us to faith and growing us in faith. Is this simply an exercise in being theologically precise? Well, yes, it is. And frankly, that's a good thing. It's important to be theologically precise so we don't fall into traps like this trap. Do I have enough faith? Did I really believe? See, those are traps we so easily fall into. And this teaching directly addresses that when it says, it's not your doing. It's God's doing 100%. It gives great comfort and relief from that trap of enough and really. So it's important to be theologically precise. But let me return to the results. The results in my life and in your life, I believe as well, the results of understanding that faith is a gift of God the Holy Spirit results in an increased thanksgiving to God and a deeper love for God when you understand that God didn't just leave it up to you. He didn't just win forgiveness and salvation on the cross and say, well, have at it and walk away. He is all over you, all your life, leading you to this trust and blessed assurance. When you know that, at least for me, I love God more, more deeply. For God is like this loving mother in my life. Think about what a difference that will make in your life when you 
love God more because of that. Think about the difference it'll make in the lives of the people you encounter when that love overflows to them. So I hope you'll come back the next couple weeks as we even learn more how deep and persistent is this love. But I invite us to stand. And we're going to close the sermon by saying this, uh, Luther's explanation of the third article, one more time. Let's together say this. I believe that I cannot, by my own understanding or effort, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in true faith. I hope that will ruminate and ripen within you. Let's pray. God, Holy Spirit, we're so thankful that you never leave us alone, that you hover over us like a brooding mother. Break down whatever barrier we have to surrender our pride and be humble before you, understanding that it is all you, God, and all glory goes to you. This we pray. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.